Useful. All right, we'll start on time. Um, welcome everybody to this panel, Post-Keynesian Institutionalism in an Era of Multiple Crises. We have six excellent papers to go through, so we'll jump right into it. With us, Zdravka Todorova, Institutional Theory, Socialization of Investment and Care-Based Full Employment for Equity and Human Development. And as a reminder, if everybody, including other presenters, could mute themselves as our presentations are going, that would be much appreciated. So thank you very much. Zdravka, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Avi. Thank you for coming to this session. Uh, I will read a summary of my paper. Um, as, I, as Avi announced, it's about institutional theory, socialization of investment and care-based for employment for equity and human development. Our institutional economics helps weave together multiple threads of today's origin system problems. I highlight five elements of old institutional theory that tie together care, equity, and human development for the purpose of re-envisioning socialization of investment and full employment. My approach is to center five contemporary issues and to move to a challenge or a deeper problem um, with the help of elements of institutional theory. The overarching theoretical objective of my paper is to explain how institutional economics drives a more ambitious understanding of full employment and a more powerful conceptualization of the post-Keynesian socialization of investment based on a broader understanding of social and economic life that encompasses diverse social relations, participation, and equity. The starting points are five perennial economic issues that are widely discussed uh, under different cases. Nowadays, one, availability and access to care, two, inadequate infrastructures, three, deprivation, four, price levels and market power, and five, well-being and environment. In light of, of five elements of institutional theory, the paper locates the above issues into even more challenging system problems. As an overview, those formulated yep. problems. Okay, as an A overview. Why did I leave so, my notebook? Oh, I thought you wanted me to. Uh, David, I think you're unmuted. Oh. Okay. Uh, those formulated uh, problems are first, access to care is viewed also as a problem of fragmented, patched up care provision and lack of desirable system of care. Second, discussing definitions and inadequacies of infrastructure should not escape. The, in, the invisible infrastructure of global care chains that are racialized, gendered, and class, and largely built on exploitative mobilities. Three, addressing any deprivation such as unemployment calls for a much broader understanding of the economy, valuing diverse economic relations that sustain life, moving beyond investment or redefining investment. Fourth, Price levels and market power entail central market planning and sustained social stratification. Five issues of well being and environment entails moving away from money as financialization and domination versus money as participation for all in different contexts. Identifying those deeper and broader problems. Um, it's helped by theoretical and conceptual insights from institutional economics. In the paper, I grouped those theoretical elements under the following headings. One, life process and living agents and systems. Two, surplus predation and invidious distinction. Three, waste, vested interest and dichotomy and valuation. And four, market planning and hierarchy. And five, resources and non-invidious recreation of communities. Those are themes that are very well known in institutional economics. I will discuss briefly each in connection to the above formulated problems. Uh, first, life process. This is the foundation of institutional theory and the scope of study is the provisioning of living agents within living systems. This provides a methodological foundation to treating care as the fabric of societies 
and inseparable from nature. First, care is central and fundamental in the economy, society and life, and outside of output-oriented reasoning, this is valid. Second, as part of the economy, care precedes all economic activities. Third, care is a process and not just an individual activity or uh, responsibility. Fourth, care is inseparable from the natural environment. Um, institutionalist subject, subject matter of the life process is as important as it is under recognized even within heterodox economics. When it comes to human beings and ecosystems, continuity, vulnerability, irreversibility, and cumulative causation are crucial for understanding the importance of reliable and comprehensive quality systems of care that can take different forms. The pandemic revealed even more the fragmented care provision that hardly could be called a system often. This includes child care, long-term care, elderly care, all sorts of health care and support system as well as education. The fragmented and patched up care provision means time compression, juggling tasks and schedules, leaving jobs and foregoing care services, worry and fatigue. Individually scrambling to secure a multitude of care is the norm. Fragmentation means inequality, which is in fact maintained throughout society. This leads us to the second theoretical point central in institutional economics, the production of social surplus, uh, predation and invidious distinction. Institutionalist understanding of social surplus is tied to predation and invidious distinction. Um, uh, in this understanding, surplus arises out of social stratification and creates hierarchies through ceremonial evaluation. Gender, race, ethnicity, citizenship, and so on, a part of uh, such ceremonial evaluation. The surplus is social because, first, it is based on a joint evolving stock of knowledge of which care is an essential part. It's not opposite of knowledge. B, uh, surplus is politically and not somehow technically determined. And C, the surplus is subject to social re-evaluation, decision-making, and institutional change, unlike the concept of consumer surplus of the mainstream paradigm. The same is valid for provisioning as a framing concept as opposed to allocation. While care is central for the economy and social life, it is political struggle to accept and normalize care centrality as a part of the so-called infrastructure. The challenge is to move towards seeing care as social process rather than single individual activity. The opposite is invidious distinction along sexism, racism, classism, xenophobic lines. The narrow view of care limits the way we understand individuals as part of ecosystems, including social response in the face of crisis. A publicly supported system of multifaceted care provision is a threat to vested interests. This has become once again evident in the current discussion about extending child tax, tax credit in the United States, for example, and the calls for work requirements, resounding all the invidious sound bites of the ending uh, of the uh, welfare as we know it from the 90s, the 2000s. But there is another piece of this story, global care chains. States have grown care chains to support the lack of publicly provided care systems to deal with structural changes or to generate reserve currencies, export um, labor power. This has merged, this has emerged within globally maintained unemployment and underemployment, targeted austerity, creditors' interests, uh, and amid psychological and political disasters, and is built on global and domestic inequities. Further, global care chains are invisible infrastructure, both for receiving and for labor exporting countries. Importantly, when we discuss care deficit in infrastructure, we should see all people who provide care, including unpaid work and the incurred strains along the global care chains. Another implication of understanding care as a process is that care should be supported globally and for everybody. The valuation that goes into production, distribution, and consumption of the surplus involves, as we can see, invidious distinction of employment and status, such as drudgery, 
uh, and categories such as drudgery and leisure. Social evaluation is crucial for access to resources, cultivating capabilities, agency, and so on. Um, the categories of what is honorific, blameful, deserving, non-deserving, other, alien, and so on is, is recurring once again in our debate. Um, many crucial paid and unpaid care, are basically drudgery, uh, and this is what uh, sustains the care systems. I will skip a little bit uh, um, for shortness. Um, an extra stable payment for children can help a parent to keep their jobs and secure child care, but also the wages of caregivers as well as care deficits uh, to caregivers' families uh, are part of the problems to be uh, solved. And when we introduce um, uh, the global uh, uh, infrastructure, invisible infrastructure, it becomes even more intractable. I will move um, uh, to briefly to talk about socialization and investment, which um, is built on those um, uh, discussions. And um, I connect uh, uh, Veblen's theory of waste to Keynes' idea of socialization of investment. Um, so at the center is a distinction between making money and making goods. Uh, Keynes' discussion is not only about driving down the interest rate, but about opportunities for making money through speculation instead of production. Veblenian dichotomy between industrial and business concern applies to business production. The industrial concern can also be extended to generally um, to livelihood, including broader view of the economy. This industrial concern is also about technical specification of human needs and lives or development within the ecosystem. In light of the above discussion, socialization of investment then is about shifting and restructuring the economy to sustain human needs and equity um, and so on validating value in generating uh, and publicly supporting activities that don't make money and are outside of the investment logic. Yet it takes efforts and creativity in networks and time to maintain and support uh, systems. And for that reason, I use the term undertaking as a broader view of what uh, is investment to count also for the undertaking and so-called entrepreneurship outside of um, what we usually call investment. Waste is a part of the system of production and consumption and, and is built in the business uh, concern um, through plant, plant obsolescence and so on. The larger the waste, a social cost and free income uh, that Peblen uses the term, um, the, the less is the the less is investment socialized, the less is the socialization of investment, and therefore the greater the need to offset this with um, um, new undertakings uh, to remediate uh, social relations in nature. Okay, I will skip the part because I'm running out of time about uh, market planning and hierarchies uh, as well, and we'll go directly to the non-invidious, the creation of community uh, and resources, uh, understanding of resources. Um, as you know, in institutional economics, resources are not, uh, they become uh, is a, a main theory, but within ecological context, and then combining this with uh, modern money, um, the, final paper, the final section concludes with that. A resource creation is not generated by monetary savings, and an economy saving and wealth are defined in terms of the industrial state of the arts which, as I said, uh, we must expand to understand generally human uh, needs and care. Uh, the concept of incomes and saving and wealth in institutional economics are developed while accounting for sustaining lives and have long departed from a narrow market um, definition. Uh, socialization of investment means moving towards the broader view of undertaking that focuses on human development and money for the public purpose entails expansion of capabilities and ecological sustainability and the supporting participation in capability rather than, rather than financialization. Um, Non-invidious recreation of community is thus a fruitful concept that could be further developed in combination with understanding diverse economic relations, modern money, to assess the degree of socialization of investment. This concept also guides the design of 
uh, on an undertaking such as job guarantee, among others, that recreate and remediate nature, people's lives, and relations. Um, so job guarantee is not just to supplement um, a regular um, deficiency of effective demand, but is to transform uh, and remediate uh, relations in nature. Uh, to conclude uh, with one definition of job guarantee, how we can think in a broader uh, way, this is a socially guaranteed commitment to maintain full employment independently of profitability through democratized, centrally funded, decentralized public service jobs that recreate, sustain, and remediate community lives non invidiously and help dismantle oppressions everywhere in different forms and contexts. I will finish with that. Uh, this broad paper, which has been basically the subject of uh, the last. Uh, let's say 15 years or more, 20 years of, uh, of um, my traje the trajectory of my uh, research. Thank you. Thank you very much. Perfect timing too. So very well done. Um, next up, we have Devin Rafferty and Valeria Moreno presenting their paper, Modern Money Theory as a Foundational Component in Polanyi's Great Transformation. Let me see if I can get my share going. Hopefully this works out. There you go. Looks good. Um, okay, here we go. Whenever you're ready. Thank you. Good afternoon to everyone. My name is Valeria Moreno. Today, Dr. Devin Rafferty and I will be presenting the paper Mother Money Theory as a foundational component in Bolani's The Great Transformation. So first off, in Polanyi's The Great Transformation, there are two central narratives. First, he discusses how 19th century society attempted to consciously construct a self-regulated market economy. And second, how this contradictory epoch created the need for intellectual content that could justify the emerging order via scientific legitimacy. Polanyi criticized both. Yet what receives little attention is the extent to which his monetary analysis is rooted in what is now known as modern, money mother in theory. The purpose of this paper is to elucidate these connections. And our thesis is that historically speaking, little attention has been given into how closely Polanyi's monetary theory is related to MMT in three main uh, overlaps, which are very significant. First, the origin and nature of money. Second, the mechanisms of to regulate money's value in the process of its creation. And thirdly, the big picture nature of each political economy. So now just talking and focusing on the great transformation, the analytical core of TGT involves how the forced transition to a self-regulating market economy necessitated the disembedding of economic relations and its loss from greater social relations which meant that labor, land, and money had to become commodified. However, these entities are and always will remain fictitious commodities in the sense that they are not innately produced for sale on a market, which made the entire transformational process inherently destructive to the very things that constituted the utopian experiment itself. Thus, to defend this trio from the self-regulating market economies naturally damaging forces, society innately developed protective countermeasures in a sequence known as a double movement, which functioned to stabilize the ontological properties of the fictitious commodities themselves, and hence preserve the system. So now talking about the origin and nature of money, when exposing why money is a fictitious commodity, Polanyi developed a critical monetary theory, which was a broadside on the conventional wisdom. Polanyi's critique focuses more on a historically accurate economic anthropology. The quotes of importance to build our case are shown here. Polanyi begins, Ricardo indoctrinated 19th century England with the conviction that the term money meant a medium of exchange that banknotes were a mere matter of convenience, their utility consistent in being there easier to handle than gold, but that their value derived from the certainty that their possession provided us with the means of possessing ourselves at any time of the commodity itself, gold. 
It follows that the national character of currencies was of no consequence since they were but different tokens representing the same commodity. Rather, he continues, commodities are objects produced for sale on a market. Actual money is merely a token or purchasing power, which as a rule is not produced at all, but comes into being through the mechanisms of banking or state finance. For Polanyi, the fundamental error of conventional monetary theory came down to the fact that the institutional separation of the political and economic spheres had never been complete. And it was precisely in that matter of currency that it was necessarily incomplete. The state, whose means seemed merely to certify the weight of coins, was in fact the guarantor of the value of token money, which is accepted in payment for taxes and otherwise. This money was not a means of exchange, it was a means of payment. It was not a commodity, it was purchasing power. Far from having utility itself, it was merely a counter embodying a quantifying claim to things that will be purchased. And finally, Polanyi dismissed the notion that money implies the economy under consideration is necessarily capitalist by noting the presence or absence of money does not necessarily affect the economic system. Right. So hopefully my internet holds up. It just froze on me. So naturally, right, with the one minute you really wanted to, so we'll see if it goes. Um, there's a lot to unwrap from those different quotes that Valeria just read, right? I mean, the first is that uh, with regard to the overlap with MMT, right? And I just want to be clear, we're not arguing that he was inspired by MMT, just that there's, you know, if you did a Venn diagram, there's a lot of overlap in regards to their monetary theories, right? Um, money's origin comes from obligations to the state, typically tax payments. That's the infamous taxes drives money principle uh, that's at the basis of MMT, right? I always found it interesting that he uses the word counter in the third quote that we had. If you want me to go back to it, it's um, on page 205, I believe. I have to move my Zoom boxes around here. Uh, yeah, 205 uh, in the standard version of uh, the Great Transformation that people usually have. Um, counter, it echoes money's role as a unit of account, which goes right back to Keynes's treatise, which is another founding component of MMT. Keynes says money of account is the primary concept of a theory of money. The state claims the right to determine and declare what thing corresponds to the name and has done so for 4,000 years, right? Is money an intrinsically valuable object or is it mainly just token or chartal, right? Well, Polanyi is very clear on this. He uses the word token over and over again, right? And that echoes Innes and Knapp, two of the founders of uh, founding inspirations, I guess you would say, for MMT. I mean, I believe Randy uh, Ray is on record as saying he thinks the 13 and the 14 papers for Innis are the two most important monetary papers ever written. I don't know if he's changed his opinion on that yet, you know, over time, but uh, I remember him saying it in class. Um, is there money present, right? It must be capitalism if there's money present, right? No, Polanyi and MMT both maintain money can exist independently from capitalism. Case study evidence has long demonstrated this, right? Okay, so, but still, money must be an efficient, commodified barter market invention, right? No, I mean, Polanyi, uh, MMT is very clear on this, and I believe Polanyi would agree with it, that nature of money is to transfer real resources and the purchasing power commanded over them uh, to the public sector, public domain, which then dictates the distribution and the structure of effective demand, okay? Uh, in terms of regulating money's value, Polanyi is again, very clear on the importance of sovereignty, right? He says, token money, whether bank or fiat cannot circulate on foreign soil. So what regulates money's value? It's the same mechanism that gives it value in the first place, which has to do with the role of taxation and how hard the state determines the populace must work for the money thing that answers to the taxes drives money obligation and a fiscal theory of the price level. If we back it up and go back to that quote, he talks about money being the embodiment of purchasing power. Well, if that comes from the state, the embodiment of purchasing power, uh, we're talking right here about the fiscal theory of the price level and at what cost we can obtain, the, the public sector can obtain the private sector's real resources, okay? Process of monetary creation. Okay, I'm going to argue he has an endogenous money model. I mean, maybe if it's in the background of his head, maybe not a full on hardcore developed endogenous money model. But we saw that the monetary creation process, token money can be bank or fiat money. Okay, token money derives its value from the tax obligations from the state, but where is it created? Okay, Polanyi is very clear here. Polanyi writes token money comes into being through the mechanism of banking or state finance 
And he says that banking involves the mechanism of supply and credit. This should sound familiar to anybody versed in the MMT pro endogenous money approach, right? Um, <clears throat> and which goes right back to Keynes. Craigle gave a presentation about a month ago, maybe, where he said it's very clear that Keynes even has an endogenous money model in the general theory, right? The whole book would fall apart with the exogenous money. Um, neither here nor there for right now. But does it sound familiar? Of course, banks, bank money's value is determined by the state, but it's created by the banks. This is endogenous money, right? In this tradition, actual money is never a commodity. It's a token that's subdivided into bank or fiat money, derives its value from the state, but it's created through the mechanism of banking and as a creation mechanism that involves supply and credit to borrowers, given the lender's liquidity preference and a margin of safety. Okay. Finally, uh, not finally, but let's go to the MMT concept of a pyramid of liabilities, right? This brings Keynes's theory of liquidity preference to the forefront. In the pyramid of liability scheme, which many of us are familiar with, uh, the state uh, occupies the top spot, right? The state, because of the role of taxation, everybody is going to always be uh, demanding the money thing that answers to the uh, TDM. Am I freezing up again? Because my computer just said it's unstable. Okay, all right. Uh, next up is bank IOUs, right? Further down the pyramid, uh, because of lender of last resort, validates the liabilities and grants them liquidity, okay? Uh, next up, whoops, I went forward. And then we have firms and households, okay? Uh, this is speculation. It's not in the general, the in the general theory, in the great transformation. Uh, but I think Polanyi would wholeheartedly agree with this concept, okay? He, token money uh, comes into being through banking and or state finance. Thanks, Avi. Uh, he clearly understood there was a difference between bank or and fiat money, or why would he not make that distinction, right? So what makes bank and fiat money fundamentally, fundamentally different from one another? It comes down to the role of taxes again, right? He saw fiat or state money as the most liquid of all monies due to the state's ability to impose the tax and therefore perpetually remain in demand. And that would be followed by bank money uh, because it derives its value from the state, okay? Uh, so then we're moving on. And now we would argue that the primary connection between Polanyi and MMT's perspective respective political economy surrounds the former's analysis of the socioeconomic traits that he thought a civil society should possess as found in TGT's final chapter entitled Freedom in a Complex Society and the leader's policy-driven ability to deliver the goods. It is helpful to start by highlighting that Polanyi declared unemployment to represent a brutal restriction of freedom and that Neither freedom nor peace could be institutionalized under that economy, at least a fair market system. Instead, we will have consciously to strive for them in the future if we are to possess them at all. They must become chosen aims of the societies. No mere declaration of rights can suffice. Institutions are required to make the rights effective. And the list should be headed by the right of the individual to a job under approved conditions. However, just because Polanyi wanted to uh, the fictitious commodification of labor to end did not mean that he thought the wage system and relative wages should be abolished. Instead, he wrote, the basic wage itself should be determined outside the market, though in the nature of things, wage differentials must and should continue to play an essential part of the economic system. So what is MMT's take? MMT's employer of less resolve delivers these goals. Ray and Chernova have shown how ELR enables all members of society to engage in meaningful employment while promoting socioeconomic goals, whether this involves a particular group's empowerment, broad social issues, or even ecological concerns. Second, ELR's macroeconomic benefits have been widely discussed, such as its preservation of full employment through time, its structuring of the composition of the man's towards consumption, its ability to crowd in private investment and lower inequality, and its civilization of prices. Thus, society directly gains from individual, social, and ecological change, and these impacts are positively reinforced through improved macroeconomic conditions. And Polanyi and MMT, uh, in my opinion, our opinion, uh, also share a take on functional finance. Polanyi writes, since the instruction of functional finance in all important states, the directing of investments 
has become a governmental task. Now, if I, sometimes I think the MMT isn't always appreciated for having a targeted approach to functional finance, but again, that's for another day maybe. Uh, if we do this at a sectoral level, properly allocate real resources to heterogeneous sectors, appropriate levels and growth rates, we're gonna land right pretty close to the Keynes socialization of investment. And of course, MMT's targeted approach to functional finance. That point, Polanyi wrote, because uh, again, this is their big picture political economy. It's possible to tolerate willingly that other nations shape their domestic institutions according to their inclinations, transcend the pernicious dogma of the necessary uniformity of domestic regimes within the world orbit of world economy. And therefore the end of the self-regulating market economy may well mean effective cooperation with domestic freedom. However, it's very important to point out, thanks Avi, uh, not all, Palani didn't think, think all markets were evil. Instead, he said that the congenital weakness of 19th century society was not that it was industrial, but that it was a market society. I'm trying to move my lip thick. Industrial civilization will continue to exist when the utopian experiment of a self-regulating market economy will be no more than a memory. Okay, so why did he want to continue to use markets? Polanyi thought markets were gonna be necessary because in the future, they're needed to ensure the freedom of the consumer, indicate the shifting of demand to influence producers income and to serve as an instrument of accountancy while ceasing to be an organ of economic self-regulation. And for me personally, this is the real point of intersection between Polanyi's um, emphasis on what traits society would have that's desirable and MMT's policy driven ability to deliver the goods, right? Because the real point of intersection is they both, both schools want to jettison the ideas, policies, and institutions associated with a neoliberal, neoclassical tradition and replace this fictitious, uh, you know, this idea, this fantasy of a self regulating free market capitalist system with something much more economically effective and humane. Because after all, in a monetary production economy, money is a real factor, financial instability is inherent, unavoidable systemic feature. So governments need to use automatic counter-cyclical fiscal monetary stabilizers to reach and maintain full employment with price stability, low levels of inequality to promote the common veal, right? For the common good. So just very briefly, our conclusions, I'll be done, I'll wrap it up, Avi, is the points of overlap. They share an economic anthropology that rejects metallism and seems to embrace what MMT calls, you know, taxes drives money and the fiscal theory of the price level. They agree on the monetary mechanisms, right? What regulates the value of money and an endogenous money model. We contend that he would agree with the pyramid of liabilities, but you know, ultimately who will know? Uh, political economy connection, they have similar views on the big picture, you know, the outlook with unemployment, wage system, functional finance, the use of markets. And so, you know, the thesis was there was a significant underappreciated connection between Polanyi and MMT, and we think we're justified in uh, arguing that. Now for the future, maybe a much more expansive uh, research uh, project on this, maybe take into account not just the great transformation, but Polanyi's collective works. Um, but we could see Polanyi is setting the agenda for what society, what traits society should have, what's desirable, and then MMT's ability to deliver it, right? We know MMT can achieve this. Just, you know, don't tell Joe Manchin, right? <laughs> Might lose a coal mine or something. Anyway, um, anyway, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Devin and Valeria. Um, next up, we have Mario Secareccia and Guillermo Romero. Is there an appropriate monetary policy framework to achieve a more equitable income distribution, the fair interest rate rule versus a full employment policy? So if you have a PowerPoint. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, yes, thank you. I have a... Uh, well, I have a PowerPoint presentation here, so I'm going to try to get it on there. Uh, let's see if I could get this one going. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Whenever you're ready. Okay. Can everybody see that? Then? Okay, good. Uh, actually, I there's a slight change in the title from when I originally gave it uh, at the time. A long time ago there, uh, it uh, I just a minor change because it actually emphasizes in a sense what this paper is really all about here, which is to some extent uh, an expression here, if you wish, of what happened over the last few years in this country. I've been involved in, in lobbying, basically, changes to the uh, uh, Bank of Canada mandate there. Uh, as you know, they, uh, they're committed to inflation targeting and all that until recently. 
And uh, uh, I, in a sense, it's really all about that because I, you know, I have, I've, over the years, I've actually been very much involved with uh, one of my colleagues, Mark Lavoie in particular, in, uh, in arguing in favor of some sort of fair interest rate rules here for central banking as well. But I, after going through this experience over the last three and a half, almost four years now, I, uh, I could say that I, I did change a little bit my tune on that, not very much at all, but to the extent that I think, uh, as you'll see in a minute there, uh, we'll, uh, you, you, there is a slight kind of tweaking and changing uh, of attitudes here. Now, let me just begin with this here and, uh, uh, and mention that uh, if you look at the current uh, situation, uh, once again, uh, unemployment, inflation, a word that we hadn't been talking about very much uh, for a long time, actually, and income distribution are very much on the radar screen again, you know, for both, uh, as I would argue here, fiscal and monetary policymakers. Now, in this uh, paper, what we do is, does, is that we look at the post-Keynesian institutionalist literature. And in that literature, there are basically two principal perspectives on how to frame policy. Okay, or central bank policy. Now, the first approach, which is associated with specific interest rate rules, starts with the view that interest rate setting uh, through central bank yeah, control here of, let's say, the overnight rate or whatever, you know, in the US is the federal funds rate, okay, uh, is in its essence an incomes policy that can then shape income and indeed also wealth distribution, but fundamentally between what we could call here, you know, what Keynes would call rentier versus non-rentier income earners over time. Now, this view starts typically and leads to a re rejection, if you wish, of the discretionary interest rate policies that uh, historically have been adopted you know, by central banks. Hence, the latter should be abandoned in favor of some sort of fixed interest rate kind of operating rule that would seek to maintain, in this case, the real central bank overnight rate at a generally low or even zero level, now depending on the authors, as we'll see in a minute, okay, that will be somehow consistent with a fair or at least a stable interest, non-interest income share over time, okay? And now in that framework, of course, there's a kind of division of labor. All the macroeconomic responsibilities, let's say of achieving full employment would be uniquely a fiscal kind of, uh, you know, activity if you wish. And uh, it could be through, well, we've been talking about job guarantee or learner kind of functional finance. Uh, so th that's the kind of one view of this. There exists, however, a, what I would call a second perspective that can also be found in this heterodox literature. And this approach starts from the principle that discretionary interest rate policy can have a significant effect, in this case, on aggregate demand. Uh, however, through what we could call here the income distribution channel of monetary policy much more so than what is normally emphasized, let's say, by the mainstream, which, of course, is on the interest elastic components of private spending that would be affected in our, you know, usual transmission mechanism story, okay, that, we're, that I believe we're all familiar with. And now within this approach, of course, uh, unless already stuck at that lower bound okay, of interest rates, Discretionary monetary policy can help in, in certain ways yet to achieve full employment. And by doing so could potentially affect other components of both the functional and the personal distribution of income. Uh, especially the wage profit shares of national income, uh, which are not normally addressed, let's say within the, the usual interest rate rules coming from, as I said, uh, heterodox economists going back to Pazinetti and others. Now, fixed interest rates rules really say very little on that wage profit relation. 
And this is because these fixed rules, as I said, they focus basically on preserving the rentier to the non-rentier income uh, shares, if you wish, of the pie through these operating rules on, on interest rates, okay? And our paper is really to explore these positions, analyze their implication, and offer a perspective on what type of full employment monetary policy would be more consistent with uh, both a more equitable distribution of income, of course, but that includes not only rentier, non rentier in a sense, but also the wage profit side, as I said, that is normally not discussed. Now, this arises because of our personal experience or my personal experience in this case uh, with lobbying for change at the central bank uh, 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 mandate here that we've been pushing for over the last few years. And, uh, and, and that's where it's coming from because of course, there's a lot of concern also with the commitment to full employment and somehow that central bank should have that as well. Okay, in the picture. And also concern about labor share, not just simply rentier, non-rentier share. Okay, so it's in that context that this is where it's coming from. Now, when observing the experience, let's say over the last dozen or plus years since the, uh, let's say the, uh, the global financial crisis, we see basically de facto something that resembles these sort of fixed interest rate rules almost, you know, I mean, in, in a kind of ironic sense here, uh, you know, ex post what we're seeing here, despite the sort of inflation targeting kind of mandates that most of these central banks have, okay, in reality, what we see is that interest rates that were set at very low levels and pretty much left there, you know, more or less for over the last decade or more now. Okay. So in a sense, quite ironically, we've had these kind of almost fixed interest rate rules. Okay. And, uh, and if they are set, let's say, on some sort of automatic pilot in accordance uh, with, let's say, I'll give you an example, the Smithton rule, okay, which basically is they would like to see interest rates, uh, real interest rates set at zero level, you know, for the central bank rates, or at extremely low level. Over the years, he's, he changes his opinion on that, but more or less, yeah. it, the idea being that you fix it and leave it there, basically, park it there for a long time, okay? Well, obviously, the most recent experience with uh, this sort of creeping or bottleneck inflation, whatever we want to call it nowadays, okay, would now advise that the central bank should be raising the overnight rate you know, since we are witnessing what in essence is a euthanasia of the rentier in the current context, okay? And, and, and therefore, it's kind of ironic here that in this context, you know, we would be, we would trade off, let's say employment for the purpose of maintaining that share of rentier income constant over time, okay? Now, at least in the industrial countries, central banks, in fact, have been pretty much, still keeping them close to the lower bond for now, okay? And, and of course, this is because either the jury here or de facto, most central banks are actually pursuing some sort of dual or multi-goal mandate that is compatible with discretionary interest rate policy sort of frameworks, okay? And indeed, this, despite the pegging of these uh, real interest rates, let's say since the global financial crisis, which seems exposed at least to be consistent with these sort of Pazinetti or Smithen rules, none of the important recent policy discussions over income distribution, I mean, I've been following what's been going on at the Fed, the US Fed, and also here in Canada, where for the first time they're all talking about income distribution. Seven minutes. Thank you for reminding me. I'm going slow. Well, what we five, five minutes, not seven. Is it five. five? Okay, I thought it was seven there. Okay. Well, I'll take seven anyway. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, what we find is that there is, in fact, these rules, and I have a, 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 a I have listed here. I, I'll, I'll skip this, but this is the typology, as I said, within the non-mainstream literature on that. And what we find, of course, is that uh, there is a problem with that. And uh, there are problems, one, because of course, if you, especially in the case of developing and emerging countries, uh, really these parking rules 
would be difficult to adhere for the kind of reasons that we've seen, especially in those countries where they have, you know, they're, they're uh, you know, they, they, they've gone, they faced the, what we call the original sin there of, of servicing debt and other, you know, in a currency other than their own. And, and, and therefore, for defensive reason, would use interest rate policy as well there, okay? But also more importantly, as I said, it's because what, what's happened here is that there's also the non-interest income that is profit and wage shares there that is of concern and that is affected by interest rate policy that one should try to trade off and deal with as well. Okay. And we, uh, you know, we've gone through that. Now, I will uh, jump very quickly here because, of course, uh, what we find here is that historically, when we look at, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, the evolution, let's say, in this case, macroeconomic policy and the evolution, especially of unemployment over time in, in, in countries like Canada and the United States, what one sees is to what extent mandates really matter. And what we, uh, what I'd like to show here is indeed what uh, happened, uh, let's say in the case of Canada and the United States over the last 70 years. And I think it's almost sort of glaring in office here that in the late 1970s until for three decades here, basically from 1950 all the way to the late seventies, the unemployment rates in Canada and the United States moved more or less in tandem. Okay, they're pretty much around the same averages. Okay, and then all of a sudden you see a, a huge gap emerging here, starting in the late 70s and, it, and early 80s, and it just continued with the, uh, with obviously, uh, what this would suggest is not that there were major shifts due to all kinds of stories that have been told about different, for instance, often they say, well, we have much greater generosity of unemployment insurance in this country or other. None of the evidence proves that as we indicate in our, in our paper. Rather, what we argue is that it basically cannot be explained other than the greater, what we call tolerance for high unemployment in Canada vis-a-vis -vis the United States. And, and this has a lot to do with the fact that in the United States, starting in the late 70s, 1970s, as anybody knows, uh, well, most of the Americans here on, uh, you know, in this audience will be familiar with the fact that you have uh, the adoption, the enactment of the, uh, uh, of the, uh, the Full Employment and Price Stability Act of 1978 which good or bad, even if they never followed it very well, the, uh, the uh, you know, the, in this case, the, uh, the central bank authorities had to at least pay some lip service to that. And in Canada, we have none of that. In fact, we went in the other direction by the early 1990s with, you know, 1991 with the adoption of inflation targeting. Now, what, we, thank you, uh, yes, Avi, I, uh, thank you. Uh, I, will, I, I will skip uh, some of this discussion here, but I would like to argue here that what we find is that uh, monetary policy here does matter and the specific mandate does matter a great deal, whether we're pursuing policies that have either uh, inflation or, or other goals, such as unemployment or a better distribution of income. And one way to show to what extent this uh, monetary policy really has an impact is by looking at some, uh, well, some work that we did empirically on that. Uh, in the case of Canada, where it's really obvious, in the United States, it's a little more complicated, the story as we, we discussed in the paper that I will not have time to go through in detail. But in the case of Canada, what we find, of course, is that obviously real interest rate policies tend to be associated positively and significantly with high unemployment, okay, as we, we saw there from that gap. Okay? But more importantly also, that unemployment tends to impact on the bargaining position of labor uh, and the economy. That is to say, we looked at an indicator, the, uh, the wage productivity gap, meaning the, uh, the, uh, the gap between real wage growth and productivity growth uh, over time. And what we find, of course, is as what we would expect, which is that 
it, when they're pursuing high interest rate policies in the case of Canada, it tends to be associated with fairly high unemployment rate. And this, of course, tends to weaken bargaining position of labor, leading to a dramatic decline in the share of labor uh, during that whole era, especially of inflation targeting. Okay. Now, I won't have time to go any further. Uh, yeah, time. Just to say right that, uh, yeah, yeah, that I yeah, I'll get to the conclusion here, which of course is what I've been saying here. That is, that as much as you know, uh, we very much like to to see uh, uh, central banks address income distribution. They should be addressing not only the uh, the round tier, non round tier shares but also the wage profit shares, which I think only a multi-goal mandate would provide the framework within which that can be addressed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mario. Um, next up, we have Tehi Joe presenting Post-Keynesian Institutionalism and Heterodox Microeconomics. whenever you're ready. Hello, everyone. Do you hear me? OK. Uh, I'm going to use my 50 minutes to talk about the following three points. Firstly, I will discuss briefly about the compatibility and complementarity between post-Keynesian institutionalism and um, heterodox microeconomics. Sorry, it's Tehi. Is anybody else only getting a black screen? There we go. Oh. Okay. Thank you. you see now. I'm sorry. Yes. Sorry. Okay. okay. So the first point uh, I want to talk about is the compatibility and the complementarity between two approaches. And secondly, I'll explore some ways to advance post Keynesian institutionalism analysis and by incorporating heterodox microeconomics. And as an example of a synthesis of post Keynesian institutionalism and heterodox microeconomics, I will briefly talk about inflation, which is one of the most much debated issues in these days. Okay. Now, The idea of post-Keynesian institutionalism goes back to uh, 1950s, Alan Grucci, but the, uh, it actually began around the end of 1970s because post-Keynesianism started in the 1970s. So we can look at the Wallace Peterson's uh, article in JI and Bob Bridgerton the Wilbur and Jameson book. And we find the idea of combining Keynes micro, I'm sorry, the macro and institutionalist micro. I think this is a very important point. I will elaborate on this later. And later in the 1980s, Alfred Eichner, who was both post Keynesian and an institutionalist, he proposed PKI and in in his sense, post-Keynesianism included Keynes, classic and Strathian traditions uh, and institutionalism and Marxist economics. So Eichner had a broader view of post-Keynesianism, I'm, I'm sorry, post-Keynesian institutionalism. Um, I think Charles Whelan, who is the organizer of this session should be given credit for moving post-Kindian institutionalism forward in recent decades. And he specifically emphasizes the Hyman Minsky's work, especially the money manager capitalism and financialization. I think that Whelan will be talking about this issue in the following presentation. Um, <clears throat> to my understanding, the post kindian institutionalism is a realist, holistic, systematic, and evolutionary approach. This is my understanding. And if, as early post kindian institutionalists argued, if the main purpose of advancing the post kindian institutionalism is to talk about the 
capitalist social provisioning process as an uh, in as an alternative alternative way to the mainstream explanation, then there is no reason to exclude other compatible heterodox approaches, especially Marxian approach. So that's why I find Eichner's approach more uh, relevant in dealing with some issues we have these days. Then let me briefly talk about heterodox microeconomics because I don't think many people know where about heterodox microeconomics. Mm. Heterodox microeconomics in the, is in the traditions of Marxian institutionalist and post keynesian economics. And main figures are scholars associated with Oxford Economist Research Group in the 1930s and 40s, like uh, the Philip Andrews and Colin Heath. And then 30s and up to 1980s, there was the Gardner Means, whose main contribution is about the, the administered price and administered inflation. I will talk more about them later in the following slide. And also Eichner and Fred Lee. They are especially the last three scholars, means Eichner Lee are both post keynesian and institutionalist. We know that. And core theories in heterodox microeconomics, I would say that monetary theory of production, the surplus approach, and the principle of effective demand and the business enterprise theory. Now, what's important is the contribution to heterodox economics in general and to the post Keynesian and institutionalist uh, economics. Firstly, probably the most important thing is the rejection of the mainstream market price mechanism and the rejection of optimizing behavior. Then, they propose an alternative analysis, which is about explaining the structure and dynamics of the economic system by linking micro interactions and macro outcomes. That's what they called the heterodox micro foundations. So the micro foundation in this context is very different from, and actually has nothing to do with the mainstream micro foundation. And if you look at the heterodox micro analysis, it is the agency that plays the most important role. Agency in the sense of decision-making process and the discretionary power of the going concerns, especially the business enterprise and the state in the system of institutions, which is viewed as differentiated, disaggregated and emergent system. So I find that Personally, the post Keynesian institutionalism and heterodox microeconomics are comparable and complementary. So let's take a look at this uh, <clears throat> diagram as an example of the synthesis of post Keynesian institutionalism and heterodox microeconomics. This is uh, the work I published a couple of years ago in JEI. If you look at this, we have the institutionalist theory of the business enterprise, starting with Thorsten Veblen in the early 20th century. And then all those institutionalists and post Keynesians view the capitalist, capitalist system developing is not fixed. So therefore, the theory itself should be changing and modified. So we have the John Commons theory and Gardner Means theory in the 30s and 50s and Galbraith and Eichner in the 70s, and then William Duggar in the 1980s, and so on and on, including other the scholars such as Munkers, Minsky, Mayhew, Atkinson, and Lee, and so on. So the main point here is that, I'm not gonna get into the details here, main point is that if you follow the PKI, theory of the business enterprise, you cannot accept the mainstream, the market price mechanism, because it is the business enterprise that drives the development of capitalism. It is the business enterprise that controls the, the quantity and price, that controls the market by creating the market or by creating the wants. So the, we have a totally different narrative here. 
then to elaborate the point that I've just made, here is the disaggregated output employment, employment model that I adopted from the work uh, done by Fred Lee and myself and published in 2011. So the, I'm not gonna get into this model here, but let me just tell you the main point here. We have two sectors, surplus goods sector, what the good for uh, final goods and services and the basic goods sector, that is the intermediate goods and services. So you can think of the input up matrix of the economy and then social product, the sum of the surplus good and the basic good and the total employment. The point here is that it is the effective demand for surplus good, which is here, that drives the production of basic good, intermediate good, and then in the process of producing basic good, and then the surplus good, we have the total social product, and then we have the employment determined within the system. So the point is, what drives what? I think it is consistent with Keynes principle of effective demand. And then how about the price? This is again, the adopted from the Fred Lee's work in his uh, 2018, the heterodox microeconomic book. Let's make it simple. And so basically this is the markup. Okay, thanks Avi. Pricing uh, principle the markup term here, gamma, and then unit material cost and unit labor cost and unit overhead cost. So I looked at some the studies and then here is the, let's suppose that the, a cappuccino, a cup of cappuccino. And from a study, I found that it costs only about 40% to get coffee beans, and the milk and sugar. This is what the material unit cost means. And then direct labor cost, only about the 56 cents per car. And then remaining is 64 cents of already cost. Then if the price of a cup of cappuccino is $4, what it means is that the markup, profit markup is 143%. This is kind of the, the uh, idea behind the price setting by the business enterprise before the business enterprise sells their own product in the market. So basically what I wanna say is that price changes because of the changes in labor, material and overhead cost, that's one part. And the other part, profit markup. But we don't talk much about this, the other side. I mean, the profit markup side. So let me talk about the then inflation. It has been an issue recent years. And let me get directly to some data. I think the, in the year 2021, the inflation was about 6.8%, I think, but this uh, data stopped uh, around the 2020. So a little bit old. And by the way, I got this figure and two other figures below from Blair Fix and with his permission to use in my presentation. So take a look at this. This is the official CPI, Consumer Price Index. So we know what the inflation is. Every year we know that, but we don't know much about the variation in inflation. What it means is that when the inflation is, let's say about 5%, yes, that's the, the average, but now there's a wide variation, meaning there are some commodities, their prices rise. At the same time, there are lots of commodities, their prices decline. We don't talk much about this. Then take a look at this more recent data also from Blair Fix. From January, 2020 to October, 2021, we have the private transportation industry the inflation was very high. 
But now go down here, men's and boys apparel industry. Prices have declined in that industry. So what makes a difference here? One is the market concentration or the power of the business enterprise. So take a look at this changes in profit margins. Or if you look, do you guys see the, this small figure there? So we can clearly see that the profit margins in the non-financial businesses have been increasing even during the pandemic recession. Now, that's one. And the other one is this one, which is quite interesting. Uh, this thick black line refers to differential markup, which is the <clears throat> profit markup of largest 500 companies in the US and in relation to the profit markup of all the businesses. Then it has been changing, of course, and it has a close relation to the whole sale, yes, price index. But now let's say that it is 1.5, meaning those large corporations chart and um, raise their profit markup about 50 times higher than other businesses. So there is a correlation between the size of the business enterprise and their pricing power. And this is just a, a distribution effect. So from the Gallup, so certainly the middle and low income class households have a financial difficulty these days because of rising the prices, but at the same time, rich classes have uh, almost no problem, right? So if, let me conclude. Well, we talk about inflation from the macroeconomic perspective, but that's, I think that just only one side of the, uh, the problem. We have to look at the most structural issues, institutional issues with, related to the inflation as I can argue, means argued, and Wilbur and Jameson argued. So to me, the macro-only analysis is insufficient to say the least. And also monetary fiscal policy with regard to the inflation is quite limited, which is quite different from what Mario said earlier. And also if we follow post-Keynesian institutionalism and heterodox microeconomic approach, we have to reject the market price mechanism because it becomes the basis of a lot of the monetary and fiscal policies. And then we need to think about those uh, <clears throat> uh, methods or measures beyond those policies, macro policies, including direct price control and antitrust in industrial policy and income welfare policy and so on. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Tehi. Um, next up, we have Charles Whalen and Yan Lang, Money Manager Capitalism and the Coronavirus Pandemic, a Post-Keynesian Institutionalist Analysis. Um, Charles, I did get your PowerPoint if you're unable to pull it up. If you could do that, that would be great. It would just make things so much easier for me. I apparently cannot share my screen and I don't know why. I'm not, apparently I'm not listed as a co-host. That might be weird. really, that's, <laughs> and you're the moderator. That's weird. But I don't, but I don't know that I can share my screen because I don't know that I'm. No, um, uh, and it doesn't look like Yana's. Uh, Monica, would you be able to either make me a host or Charles a host so we can. Yeah, make, make, I'll be a host if you can, because I've already got my, my presentation up on my screen. And if I share my screen, I can't see the presentation. Or everybody can just read my presentation. <laughs> sure. Okay, I'll give you one moment. Thank you. You're welcome. You should be able to have that capability now. OK. Let me oh, just... great. Thank you so very much. Pull these up. And you're welcome. OK. Can everybody see that? Yes, I can. Okay, great. And Charles, if you wouldn't just mind telling me when to change the slides, sure. that would be great. Absolutely, I will do that. Great. And thank you for doing this. And uh, thank you for moderating. 
Also, I'd like to thank uh, Mary Rand and Avi and my fellow presenters for this opportunity to advance post-Keynesian institutionalism and explore its intersection with other traditions. I also thank my collaborator, Yen Liang, who took the lead on a more far-reaching chapter that we have prepared on money manager capitalism and the pandemic for a modern guide to post-Keynesian institutional economics. Uh, and this is a volume that was edited uh, recently and will be edited, I'm sorry, will be published by Edward Elgar in April. The paper that I'll summarize today derives from that chapter and I'll focus on just one aspect of the current crisis, inadequate industrial capacity. As we know all too well, the COVID-19 pandemic shook the world economy and triggered one of the sharpest economic downturns in US economic history. Um, while federal financial assistance helped stabilize uh, the economy and a rollout of vaccines facilitated the recovery, the ongoing social and economic consequences have been tremendous in the United States and around the world. Although the lack of a competent and coherent initial response to the pandemic worsened the severity of the national crisis, fundamental features of the current economic era also have been contributing factors. This era, which took root around 1980, is described by post-Keynesian institutionalists as money manager capitalism. Among the era's observed features are increased economic instability, spreading worker insecurity, rising income inequality, and an extreme subordination of industrial production to financial pursuits. And if we can move on to the second slide, that's great. So our paper, thank you, our paper, centers on that, in, that subordination of industrial production, a phenomenon that fueled the problem of inadequate industrial capacity during the pandemic. We begin with a brief overview of money manager capitalism, then we trace inadequate industrial capacity to several consequences of that era's single-minded focus on shareholder value, offshoring, offshore outsourcing, corporate mergers and acquisitions, and stock buybacks. Of course, accompanying this era's inattention to goods production is a corresponding neglect of services, which also has intensified our crisis, but we limit our attention to goods in the current paper for the obvious reasons of time and space requirements. If we can move on to the next slide, please. So we'll start with money manager capitalism, which is the name that Hyminsky gave to the stage of capitalism that began to take shape in the United States in the decades after World War II replacing the era of managerial capitalism that preceded it. That began, of course, with the New Deal. Money manager capitalism emerged over time, but it took root, again, money manager capitalism, took root around the early 1980s, although it was evolving into that throughout the post-war period, with rising income, economic and political influence of institutional investors being the key characteristic, the rising economic and political influence of institutional investors. Since the aim of money managers is to maximize shareholder value, money manager capitalism is a shareholder driven system in which fund managers and corporate executives obsess over near term profits and stock prices. And we'll move on to the next slide. And then we'll see, as we all know, institutionalists have long recognized that making goods often takes a backseat to making money. But signs of a fundamental change on this matter began to emerge in the late 1970s. And it was unmistakable soon thereafter, resulting in considerable concern among many observers about the consequences for workers, communities, industrial development, and even national security. As Chris Nagel showed in a 1988 article in the JEI, U.S. non-financial corporations shifted their focus from design, production, and marketing of goods and toward the ownership of financial assets and activities traditionally associated with financial corporations, thereby blurring that distinction that used to be there between these two types of firms of financial and non-financial. Corporations also shifted from a retain and reinvest approach to resource allocation and embraced instead a downsize and distribute model that focuses relentlessly on cost cutting and distributing the freed up cash to shareholders. As money manager capitalism emerged, the result was mass plant closings and a seismic shift toward job offshoring, which soon combined with 
outsourcing. So it's not just offshoring, but it's outsourcing and just-in-time production and delivery. And there was also a frenzy of mergers and acquisitions. Often so, industrial corporations could diversify away from manufacturing and embrace other lines of business, including financial services, but also for other reasons, and we'll talk about that. More recently, corporations have devoted huge amounts of financial resources to stock buybacks, reinforcing money manager capitalism's trend away from technological development and industrial innovation. And now we'll talk about offshoring, which is on the next slide. Let's look briefly at these developments, starting with offshoring. By the mid 1980s, the US business practice of relying on workers in other countries for parts or for assembled products could be found in most industries through arrangements often involving joint ventures, foreign subsidiaries or foreign suppliers, and licensing agreements. This so-called hollowing of American corporations was no accident. The dictates of money manager capitalism, combined with improvements in technology and in communications, drove the push for offshore outsourcing. By enabling firms to reduce input and operating costs, such outsourcing fit perfectly with corporations' focus on shareholder value. While offshore outsourcing helped boost returns to corporate shareholders, it also weakened domestic manufacturing capacity, a problem laid bare by the current pandemic. At the outset of the crisis, um, the US economy faced dire shortages of personal protective equipment and vital medical supplies, such as nails, swabs, and ventilators. A major reason is a heavy reliance on imports for the bulk of these items or the components required to construct them. And most often these imports came from Asia, not only Asia, but many times from Asia, which was facing its own acute needs for these items. The medical supplies problem was exacerbated by poor crisis planning and coordination, not only before the crisis, but also well into the first year. Moreover, much of this equipment supply chain has remained precarious. Again, in part because of, of this, this just-in-time production system that is the whole purchasing system for uh, firms in the era of money management capitalism. And now two years into the crisis, concerns are rising about lack of test kits and other medically related shortages as COVID-19 uh, cases spike yet again. Now on the next slide, I'll move into uh, moving beyond just medical equipment. Unfortunately, medical equipment shortages were just the start of the nation's supply chain nightmare. As a journalist recently wrote in The Atlantic, it's currently an everything shortage. For much of the past year, car parts, semiconductors, apparel, electrical equipment, and countless other products have been scarce. And if you've tried to do any home repairs, you may have run up against this yourselves, never mind trying to shop for people during the holidays. And in fact, in the article in The Atlantic, it was described as a veritable hydra of bottlenecks, not a problem traceable to a single choke point. As a result, prices are rising, delivery uncertainty is widespread, and analysts expect this uh, set of supply difficulties to last throughout 2022. And I mentioned some of these elements in the, in the, uh, in the paper itself, that this uh, veritable hydra of bottlenecks, some of the different dimensions to it. The link between money manager capitalism's erosion of industrial capacity and the supply chain mess is unmistakable. Today, even US made products almost always use at least some imported components. And companies seeking to expand domestic manufacturing capacity in the US face shortages of imported building supplies. Moreover, some economists predicted that firms engaging in offshore outsourcing would use these increased profits to invest in productive assets. Well, that didn't happen that way. Instead, as demonstrated by economists such as Will Milberg and Deborah Winkler, US corporations have cut back on their fixed investment and increasingly doubled down on pursuit of near-term shareholder value via financial channels. And on the next slide, we'll see one of those. And, and so here we talk about the use of mergers and acquisitions, which have trended upward since the mid 1980s. Today, mergers and acquisitions can be an important way for established corporations to obtain innovative products, technologies, and intangible assets without engaging in time-consuming, risky, and costless research and development. And I think actually some of Avi's research has touched on some of these matters. Uh, but mergers and acquisitions are always uh, designed to advance or even to use new technology. And again, I think Avi has touched on this as well. Sometimes these mergers and acquisitions are used to reduce or head off 
competition, which is nothing new because Medwin talked about um, sabotage my business uh, quite some time ago. So if we change to the next slide, we'll see an example of this. The failed attempt of the US government to stockpile portable ventilators since 2006 provides a tragic illustration of acquisitions driven by maximization of shareholder value. The paper provides the details, um, but the bottom line is, is, is that well before the crisis, a company contracted to make portable ventilators was purchased by a large medical device company that killed the project, apparently because the portable units weren't sufficiently profitable, it would hurt that company's existing line of, of ventilators. Then when the pandemic hit, medical goods and services were rationed on an unprecedented scale. And according to an article in the New England Journal of Medicine, ventilators were the most problematic of all. Another way firms have sought to boost shareholder value is through share repurchases, also known as stock buybacks. And on the next slide, I'll start to talk about some of that. These are very much a product of the era of money manager capitalism. In fact, buybacks it, by issuing companies were considered stock manipulation and were effectively prohibited in the US from the 1930s until 1982. By reducing the outstanding shares of a company, buybacks tend to increase share prices. As a result, they become large corporations' favored means of distributing cash to investors since the late 1990s. Just prior to the pandemic, the percentage of S&P 500 companies engaging in buybacks reached 85%. Corporations reduced buybacks when the pandemic hit, but the funds allocated to buybacks have risen each quarter since mid-2020 and are estimated to have approached a record-setting high of nearly $1 trillion in this past year, 2021. If we change the slide to, to the next one, more on buybacks. In this paper, we present evidence showing that buybacks and dividend payments as well are correlated with lower real investment and lower research and development. So then we argue that such financial devices have contributed to the industrial capacity problem that the nation has faced during the pandemic. And one example of this that we mentioned is the case of semiconductors and we mentioned the PPE example as well in the paper. At the same time that the nation faces chip shortages affecting a variety of industries, the semiconductor industry has been lobbying for tens of billions of dollars of federal assistance to quote, strengthen and sustain American leadership in chip technology, unquote claiming that such leadership is, quote, essential to our economy and national security, unquote. However, research by Bill Azonik and Matt Hopkins demonstrates that such companies could have easily bolstered domestic chip production on their own. Instead, they simply focused on buybacks and profit distributions instead of plant and equipment, R&D, and process innovation. In short, the semiconductor industry appears to be one of many industries affected by the trend toward predatory value extraction in the age of money manager capitalism. And the resulting effects have contributed to inadequate industrial capacity during the current crisis. And now we'll move on to the very last slide. And in conclusion then, this paper links the problem of inadequate industrial capacity during the pandemic to the following consequences of money manager capitalism's focus on shareholder value, offshore outsourcing, corporate mergers and acquisitions, and stock buybacks. To be sure, it won't be easy to fix the systemic problems that the pandemic has, has exposed. There are a variety of policy fixes that post Keynesian institutionalists and like-minded economists have to offer. In fact, the paper mentions some of those at the end of the paper, and we can talk about them during the discussion. But of course, they're not new, and most of a very long time faced fierce opposition. However, the COVID-19 crisis, I think, has made one thing clearer than ever. What's good for the US uh, corporations diverges often very sharply uh, from what's good for Americans. Uh, that's it. Thanks. Thank you very much, Charles. Um, next up, last but not least, we have Gary Dimsky and Alex Woodford presenting Reshaping Macroeconomic Analysis for an Era of Multiple Crises, Insights from Post-Keynesian Institutionalist and Stratification Theory. Thanks. And Monica, could you enable Alex to be able to share? Oh, you got it. Okay, good. Yeah, thanks, Gary. 
Um, first, uh, just a, a brief pro proviso. I think there's a party going on in my building, so apologies for any loud noises that may uh, suddenly uh, come through the microphone. Um, okay, amazing. Uh, so, um, can everyone see the screen okay? Yeah, brilliant. Okay, so um, first up, thank you very much uh, to the organisers for setting up this session and for the inclusion of our presentation. Over the next 15 minutes, uh, we aim to try and provoke uh, some discussion on how we should mould macroeconomic analysis as we progress further into an era of multiple crises. So I'm going to start by outlining uh, the motivation and framing of our investigation. Um, and then Gary will go on to reflect um, about this uh, moulding process in respect to uh, post-Kinsian institutionalist and stratification theory. So our motor motivation, um, as, as you may have heard, the global economy is currently in the grip of three interlocking price crises the coronavirus pandemic, uh, rising inequality and popular economic resentment, and the worsening effects of climate change. Um, as we can see from these quotes from Rebuilding Macroeconomics and the Managing Director of the IMF, um, this uh, is being recognized by evolving research agendas and institutional priorities. Uh -huh. Um, however, um, these are not holistic. Uh, they focus on how the economy accounts or responds to environmental and social factors, rather than viewing the economy as um, part of a, a larger system. So that led us uh, to search for a systematic frame with which to uh, consider these different crises. And that led us to a donut. Uh, specifically Kate Raworth's donut. Um, so this is a very popular conceptual frame uh, in the UK. Um, it's widely referred to in the ecological, economic and sustainability literature, uh, where the authors are looking to consider uh, what a uh, good life for all looks like and how we can get there. So there are three key features of uh, the donut. First, the ecological ceiling. Uh, so this is the outer ring of the donut. Um, on a global scale, uh, this was inspired by uh, Rockstrom et al's uh, nine planetary boundaries. Uh, so um, most obviously that includes uh, climate change, um, but also things such as ocean acidification, uh, phosphorus and uh, nitrate uh, loading, um, and biodiversity uh, reduction. And the fear is once we've exceeded this ecological ceiling, um, we're at risk of uh, hitting certain tipping points, which fundamentally and irreversibly change uh, the dynamics of the life support systems that we as individuals depend upon. Second, uh, the inner circle of the donut uh, is uh, the social foundation. Uh, so Raworth uh, links these uh, to the Sustainable Development Goals, in particular uh, 12 uh, social goals uh, that link to basic needs, so food, uh, water, uh, work and uh, employment. Um, and then we have uh, the space in between the ceiling and social foundation. Um, and this is the safe and just space within which the economy uh, should exist and uh, function. Uh, so the donut in itself, um, Kate Raworth in her book uh, criticizes economics as a discipline uh, for failing to take a more holistic view uh, that accounts for our planetary boundaries and social inequalities. Uh, so while we think this broad, broad brush uh, critique is warranted, um, it's, we don't feel that it adequately uh, considers um, how um, this can be operation, operationalized uh, in applied and theoretical work on economic and social policy. 
So this led us to a question, how can insights from post-Keynesian, institutionalist, stratification theory and political economy be merged together with planetary boundaries and donut approaches, which Gary will now go on to talk through. Thanks. So yeah, so this, uh, as you can see, this is part of this continuing effort for us to have a dialogues that are meaningful uh, with uh, ecological economics. And uh, basically, so, you know, we start by what does Rayworth want? And if we, if we drill down into her text, actually, what she wants is what, say, Charles and all of the members of this panel have been talking about, kind of institutional Keynesian approach. Uh, just a couple of examples here, uh, just picking things up from her text. Uh, she celebrates the institutional economics of Veblen and Polanyi. Uh, they, you know, this idea about the markets, how they're shaped by laws, institutions, policies, and culture. She quotes a nice quote from Ha Jun Chang. And uh, that last paragraph is just a, you know, a little bit of detail where she says, you know, everything affects everything else. Things are, are, are linked together. It's not uh, a kind of a situation where we go market by market and imagine that these all come from preferences. She's got the picture. And in fact, then we go to the next slide. And uh, what she wants then, she says, well, you know, forget about the free market, think of the embedded market. And of course, this is such a nice language in terms of uh, how we, we move from institutional economics. And as she says, you know, strange though it sounds, there's no such thing as deregulation, only re-regulation that embeds the market in a different set of political, legal, and cultural rules. And, you know, as, as say Mario was, you know, trying to talk about how he's trying to influence, shifting who bears the, the risks and costs. Now, interestingly, you'll notice that she then offers this, this idea of um, a figure about how the economy is re-embedded in society and the ecology. Now, if you think of it in terms of her planetary boundaries on the outside, and then the social boundary on the inside. Notice that interestingly here, she's got the economy inside. So she needs the economy to be taking care of business for us. Now, next slide, please. But, and, and just to say that uh, she also appreciates it. There's lots of great stuff about Keynes scattered through this book, this uh, donut economy book, which has been as, as uh, Alex was noting so popular and so used, uh, especially in Europe and the UK. Um, and, you know, talking, she appreciates the anti-depression policies. She's got a whole thing, a statement about how the Hayekian view uh, has led to this sort of, you know, in, influence buying by the right wing um, and blaming government for all the problems. Uh, what she says is, well, you know, Keynes' demand-led approach invisibilizes the ecological costs. So we have to make them visible and uh, just and the, the rest of the page just detail to say that she they she goes and she supports Minsky um, and she basically gets the idea that there's a small financial elite that's controlling the public good of money creation, profiting from it and destabilizing the wider economy. So, you know, she 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 writes in her chapter two, time to turn this upside down scenario the right way up and redesign finance so it flows in service of the economy and society. Uh, that is really, she's calling for the, the institutionalist Keynesian approach that we've heard for the last couple of days. Next slide, please. Now, the thing is that she does it, when she gets to it though, she goes like player by player. She gives each player a pre-designated role. It's like setting out the characters in the play, showing how they should pr function properly. Here's an example where, you know, she says, okay, so there's no such thing as a free market or free trade. All cross-border flows are set up against the, the background of history, institutions, and power relations. Right. And as she notes, as the crisis illustrates, it shows that effective cooperation can make things work. Uh, and then her next point, the next figure on the page is, you know, she then points and says, well, power. So let's check its abuse. But there's a kind of willed naivete in here because this text and the way she sets out these players on the stage ignores the kind of, if you will, historical institutional baggage that she says we need to think about. It, she is invisibilizing 
the political economic processes that lie behind and reinforce this power. Next slide, please. So, you know, one thing that we're gonna emphasize, there's many things now to be said, but we're just gonna bring in stratification and the fact that there's conflicts, race, gender, ethnicity, and so on, that arise in the context of these mechanisms, this institutional and historical structures that generate and reproduce inequality along these intersectional lines. So in, you know, in this era of free capital flows and the global factory, which he doesn't like, there are these embedded elites that are pressing their advantage, as we just heard from the other papers, against those who are below them in the pecking orders. Uh, in financial crises, reduce the capacity of uh, lead to bailouts for the elites, reducing the margin for nation state protections of social welfare. In, in, and in lower income countries, they threaten the survival of people and even lead to you know, work seeking out migration. The invasions then of national spaces by diverse others, people from racially subaltern groups, different religions, and so on, then lead to or feed voter revolts against too generous benefits to the increasingly alien lower income populations, the kind of thing we've seen with Brexit and, of course, in the US. Next page, please. Now, what we're going to then do is say, well, let's just think. How can we bring the stratification division into the, the donut concept? And well, here we have you know, the blue outer circle, there's your planetary limits, and the green inner circle, there's your social and living limits. They're the same. But we just note that you know, we have a planet where arrayed on the planet are these countries. And the, the idea here is the light, the light color is like the whole country's population. And, uh, and, and the, the idea is that you know, part of this population is living outside planetary boundaries, and the, some of the population is living below some kind of social limit. And uh, so it shows that there's, you know, different patterns. This is just suggestive with the, I picked the Philip. we picked the Philippines just because, you know, they sent a lot of folks out to, to do work elsewhere. And there's the US and India and China. But, and, and then inside the countries, we have the idea that there are subaltern populations that are disadvantaged and often scapegoated and you know the US India China are picked out there next slide please now you know in some sense what to do about this how do we move to the planetary boundary space while you know working with the fact that there are these barriers to prosperity and even things allowing some to go above planetary boundaries and sinking others below the social boundaries. Well, you know, Keynesian economics can help us here. Um, and, and one thing about it is that one of the first thing is to say that there's uncertainty. Uh, the, the planetary boundary concept is really put forth with a kind of degree of certainty in science that's probably unwarranted, especially when it comes to what fixes might be available for those problems. And then we know that there's, you know, we need action at the macro level. It's a fundamental Keynesian point. Uh, interacting with micro markets, as was mentioned earlier um, by, by Tay Lee. And, you know, of course, and stagnation is something that we have to work with because, you know, this, this problem of growth. So we have human populations that live in spatially separate countries with income generation processes and power dynamics that reproduce stratification. So her this kind of continuous circle diagram suggests flows around the, and there's examples like this could work, this could work and so on. But human organization imposes barriers and sets up these and requires macro level interventions. And that means we have to work through the nation state to solve the donut challenge. It's an unavoidable mechanism for organizing activity. Next slide, please. This one and then one more and we'll be done. Um, just to say that now let's add in kind of one more thing. So there are these kind of like, if you will, unequal national stones along the circular donut path. Uh, and achieving SDGs and climate calming has to require financing across borders, the action of, of the, you know, the governments that are cooperating from within these national boundaries, working with their own problems, and either helping their own people or exploiting them or permitting their exploitation. And uh, basically, efforts to date are falling well short. Uh, and in part, just thinking of finance for the minute, 
Uh, that's because the global, the, you know, we've talked the blended finance has been mentioned. We got some critiques about that because the global financial system has established for its elite members a lifestyle threshold that's depicted here in red. Outside everything, right? They are living large. They're even trying to think about how to leave this planet and live on their own and their uh, sarcophagi or whatever they're going to be. And so this requires, you know, living this way also requires transfer for the surplus from populations living inside the boundaries uh, to them to themselves. And there's a little arrow there depicting the subprime mortgage boom, feeding that global elite that, of course, paid no price. The system of finance is at the at the root of at, that is at the root of global instability economically cannot provide the solution to global sustainability. The nation states have to take action and get control of that. Last slide, please. So we're gonna end up in an idealistic mode. Uh, we want this conversation. We're trying to find ways to talk to the ecologists, say, you gotta move and work with us on the systematic analysis of macro and micro, as well as microeconomies. So a transformed economics, what you want, Kate Rayworth, uh, is to, to achieve donut sustainability, ecological and social, we must, first of all, have a specifically macro component um, and that assures national stability while we're working on you know, micro scale lifestyles and interventions and doing circular economies and so on. Secondly, we, we need to really confront and think about the purposes of and controls over globalized financial firms. Thirdly, we have to move toward a global economy that doesn't force the contraction and support for social welfare and fairness initiatives. This goes to uh, where uh, Z started us, uh, that, you know, that, that does those things when you have cross-border deficit. We need to sustain people as we try to save the planet. Can't do one and not the other. And finally, and this is our super idealistic ending, we have to integrate strategies for reducing the debris of stratification while managing climate change and managing the macroeconomy as well. Uh, this is the, what we have to put onto ta the table so that we can really have conversations. It, I know they've been started with Green New Deal, uh, but the, that, that conversation has just started and needs to be much more fully embraced. And our idea here is let's start with a framework that's kind of the framework for the ecological community now and see if we can come from their end and work back in some of the ideas that are home ground from a Keynesian institutionalist viewpoint. Thanks for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Gary and Alex. Um, by my clock, we have about 20 minutes left for questions. Um, so we'll open up the floor to questions. Anybody has any? Um, either in the chat, if it's possible, or you can raise your hand. I guess they're ringing bells outside my office. Um, if there are no questions, I will ask a question. I tried as we were going to come up with at least one for everybody. Um, but uh, starting with uh, Charles and Jan, um, how much of the shortage in medical supplies do you think was really tied to the way in which policymakers chose to manage the crisis and, and in the context of crisis management theory in general, just kind of the emphasis on financialized channels of crisis management? If that question makes sense at all. Yeah, I think that that's a really big part. I'm my, I'm not muted, so you're hearing what I'm saying, right? Yeah, I think that's an important part, but but there's, you know, there's more to it. It's not just that we had Donald Trump and other equally incompetent um, and malicious people running this thing. Um, I think at the same time, you know, the, the fact that the money manager capitalism focuses so much on shareholder value and, and wants just in time, um, you know, and the fact that there's, there's a conflict between providing supplies that, that keep your workers safe and maximizing you know, shareholder value. I mean, that, that's, that's part, something that we should be able to understand as, as post case institutionalists. Um, and, and, you know, I, I've been fine finding that in the literature, even in some of the, some of the healthcare 
uh, literature, they're talking about this and they're saying that there are a variety of reasons for the, the, the crises, uh, the shortages that they face. Um, and, but, you know, but some of them have to do with these um, um, just-in-time um, uh, approaches and the, um, the, um, the, the purchasing system that is so heavily focused and the, and the, uh, and the, in the, uh, the, the management systems that focus so heavily on, on shareholder value, right? I mean, it's, and it's not just, it's not just the um, uh, industrial production, but it's also the, the beds in the hospital and the staff, right? So, um, so I think that, that yes, um, some of it can be blamed on, on poor planning, some of it can be blamed on poor government, but a lot of it has to do with money marriage capitalism. Thank you. Um, so I'll continue to ask questions. Um, so th this is more for Zdravka, but Gary and um, Alex and can also chime in just when we're talking about stratification and when we're talking about social stratification, the context of care work, who's doing the care work. Uh, one of the things that I find, especially with the context of institutionalism interesting is that and maybe this is my own reading, there, there doesn't seem to be a clear cut way in which it's understood how stratification is maintained, at least as the economy evolves, as society progresses, we do still continue to see the same patterns of stratification. So I, I hope um, Stravka, Gary, Alex, if you could speak to just in the context of your own research, how these patterns of stratification can be main, are maintained and how they can be broken? It's a big question, but the part that I skipped uh, was about uh, market planning and hierarchies. Uh, and part of those are, of course, the administered pricing and uh, just the, all the mechanism articulated by Dagger or E, whatever. Monkers. Uh, but what I wanted to point out is that within those, those cannot be separated from the social certification. Actually, Linwood could elaborate probably more even on those. Um, uh, what I want, what I'm making a point in this paper is that those are inherently connected uh, to the, you know, corporate hegemony and uh, central uh, market planning. Um, and also that is why we have this perennial uh, scarcity deficit debate when it comes um, to kind of a temporary injection versus when something starts looking like a, a permanent or long-term, um, like the child uh, credit debate currently, uh, when it becomes to be threatened to be permanent suddenly, um, you know, it's it just, it's politically infeasible. I, and I, my argument is that this is part of the central market planning discussing institutionalism in, uh, together with the administered pricing uh, uh, aspect and other. If, uh, in, in just a couple of reactions. One is that um, on, on our, for me at least, um, there's not a serious discussion about inequality among human beings and the fact that these are structured inequalities in which that the whole point of stratification theory is that one, it's a zero sum game many times. They miss that part and this has to be put down um, very strongly so that the ecological community will see that it's just not, you know, enough is enough, living within limits. Okay, whatever, um, but let's get real about how things are structured. Uh, second, so that partly this is a, to emphasize something that's missing in the ecological uh, mindset and, uh, and so on. Second point would be that, uh, that the exploitation of, of uh, intergroup rivalries and historical differences is part of the warp and woof in the way in which capitalism works and reproduces itself. It's great to see Linwood Tahid here and you know, we could go on for several hours talking about the ways in which that little blue arrow I, you know, we had where we show the little surplus going up from the exploited uh, inner city uh, workers and homeowners who are gonna get ripped off in the subprime crisis. Um, that's part of how that financial elite feeds itself and then pays no price. So this is built into the structures of control uh, that have to really be dealt with. And a third thing I would say is that actually there was 
you know, we, we learned in an earlier session today uh, about the sort of inspiring ways in which some communities are breaking away and learning to do things differently, working outside of the strictly capitalist orbit. And that, of course, is a kind of thing that is celebrated and rightly so by some of our you know, good friends in the ecological movement, the circular economy and all that. That's corresponding with that, farms and all that. But at the same time, uh, Zidraka had a fantastic paper in that session talking about the way in which it's convenient for people once they are forced out of their home countries to send the remittances and the remittances destabilize both the home country and the guest country and, and cause human stress uh, that it pays in, in which people pay a huge price uh, in order to keep the whole circus going in a system that basically is already so wounded that there's no way to have people have reasonable lives in their own spaces and to survive and keep, you know, keep the thing going. I'll stop there. Will, question. Yeah, this question's for uh, Gary and Alex. I mean, one of the issues that I've always had with, um, you know, Keynesian or post-Keynesian ecological, you know, uh, theories that try to combine themselves is the growth imperative. Right. I mean, and I don't know. I don't know if those are reconcilable. Certainly one can make the argument, you know, uh, over a Green New Deal from an MMT perspective and um, yeah. how you can solve some social inequalities, uh, have massive infrastructure investment in high voltage transmission and, you know, wind and solar and storage capacity and all of those things. But if that always translates into more and more growth from an ecological perspective, I just don't see how we can reconcile those things. We're, we're not going to grow our way to sustainability, I don't think. And so have you guys thought about that um, with regard to your analysis of the um, donut economics? You want to take it, Alex? Uh, feel free to Gary. <laughs> yeah, you know, yes, and and actually, you know, when when these colleagues were talking about, um, you know, Tim Jackson and and Dan O'Neill and others, uh, say, you know, enough is enough. We've got to live within the limits, and you know, they're right. And uh, the the degree of change in everyday lifestyle is so radical. Uh, that we can't even begin to comprehend it yet. There was a great paper uh, also in the earlier session on trying to rethink money and how you would kind of eco-sustain money. Um, or there's, there was a nice term of, turn of phrase uh, that I just written down here somewhere um, that uh, basically to make it compatible, we, we don't have solutions there yet. We, we know that this capitalist economy will collapse and it will collapse to, uh, you know, with, with prejudice on people who are already down um, and, and given the power structures in place. So this, these kind of discussions about how do you transition, this is where, you know, it, we have to have very real conversations about how do we opt out at that top level um, and the top levels and, and really just make as clear critiques as we can of the, for example, the blended finance conversation is to say, check it out. It's the, it says this, let's solve climate and SDGs by basically having the private market provide the financing with all of the risk taken by sovereign governments and multilateral banks. In fact, let's repurpose the World Bank to be essentially to write insurance uh, to underwrite the risk that's taken. Obviously, that's a completely ridiculous proposal by people who have been living so far out on that red line we drew that they, they've totally lost you know, sight of reality. So, you know, yeah, we've thought about it. And, you know, how do we have these conversations, you know, that are within the bounds of seeming reality of what's possible without seeming to be, without saying, look, you know, you're talking about 
world rules and to tax havens, you know, like go down the list that we would have. And we need that world, you know, global governance of finance so that it just serves the people combined with MMT type principles to allow communities to do what they need. Um, it's, it's, it's always there, always there is the challenge. I'm not gonna, I mean, one thing that keeps me going is we have to go further. Some of the things that Keynes imagined for, in, you know, that future for our grandchildren was such a nice, comfortable vision, right? The rocking chair. And now the ecological crisis has put that out of our reach. So we don't have any rocking chair. We gotta keep going and, and do our best to use these tools that we have. Uh, Daphne. Uh, thank you. I uh, want to address that issue about um, growth and, and how you deal with um, help, helping people be better off when there are these ecological limits. I think it's really important to differentiate between throughput and growth. That's something that a most non-ecological economists don't do very often. Growth is measured in monetary terms and throughput is the uh, use of, of physical um, phenomena and, it, and the strain on physical limits. So there are, there are limits to the throughput that we can have, the effect of use of materials and um, pollution of you know, the atmosphere, but um, those aren't the same as limits on how much money can circulate between different people. Yeah, yeah. And that, would, and, would you and, mind if I just made a statement on that too? Because I think, I mean, I, 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 while I agree with that, economic growth is a monetary unit uh, measurement. But if you look historically, and you know, right up to the present day, economic growth has meant more material usage, more pollution, more emissions. And I think that we can get in a real bind if we don't acknowledge that you know, at least throughout all of history, economic expansion has meant more ecological destruction, more resource use. And, you know, we can have these material or energy efficiency gains, but those material and energy efficiency gains when paired with growth have to be massive in order to reduce our ecological footprint. I mean, if we're if the economy is going to grow at three percent, then our you know efficiency gains, material and energy efficiency gains, have to grow at greater than three percent, which is not very likely. It, but so. yeah, it, I would but, definitely, uh, if I can just respond quickly to that, I, I would definitely agree with that. That historically they have been the same. That's why it's so important to interject the difference into all the discussions we have to be talking about throughput as well as growth. And you're right that um, efficiency gains can't do it all. There do have to be changes in how we see a good life, uh, what consumption is in distribution, et cetera. Um, but I just think that that distinction is important to keep in mind. If I, and if I could intervent, uh, it seems to me that Tay Lee's um, characterization of you know the, the two ways in which the ways in which the in a sense throughput is there and then there's the, the surplus and uh, that kind of concept and Amit Baduri has been doing some interesting work along this lines as well uh, is you know maybe a way to begin thinking about how things work and I should I, I'd also like to acknowledge that John uh, Nicol Arson at the earlier session was really doing some very innovative thinking about how you would begin to rethink value. That's rethinking value is something we've been trying to work with at Leeds as well, working with engineers and uh, ecologists. Yeah. yeah. Great, thank you. Um, this question's for Mario. Um, good to see you all. Um, so I guess I have two questions that are related. One is that what is the point of reward savings? Um, what is the justification of doing that? And second is you argue for discretionary interest rate policies and when the interest rate changes, there's so many different changes in the source of the income. You could change 
the returns on many different assets. And so how do you make sure that income distribution is actually improving in the way you want it to be? Is, is interest rate policy actually capable of doing that? Um, I, thank you for the question and great to see you. I, uh, and also I think I saw, <laughs> Uh, yeah, Eric, it's okay, <laughs> okay, okay. Anyways, to get to the, I'm not trying to avoid your question, on the contrary, uh, but great to see you. Uh, however, uh, what I, uh, yeah, it's a, it's, a, you know, I had a, as I was saying, I'm coming from the, from literally trying to lobby changes to central bank behavior in a sense, or, you know, mandates there. And I spent a lot of time on this. And the reason why it, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's important to sort of uh, pose the question the way I did in this case, rather than any other way, is because of a number of reasons. One of them, of course, is fundamentally the fact that most people out there don't understand these simple rules that are, whether it's the Pazinetti rule or, or the, uh, or the uh, whatever, the uh, Smith and rule, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> but more importantly, uh, is the fact that when we look at the uh, uh, income distribution, it is clear that there are going to be trade-offs that are going in various direction because there are at least three major players there, we could say, if not more, actually, I would say. I mean, but at least within the kind of market you know, system here, we will talk about, you know, rentiers, you know, if you take the kind of Keynesian divisions here, you know, wage earners and, and business profit here. And what, what has to do the art of central banking, okay, the way I see it, is how to be able to manage those relations in some ways that are meaningful and that drive towards cohesion rather than towards centrifugal kind of forces that are generated that lead to really terrible biases. And that is why I was in favor of a discretionary policy here, because that's what the art of central banking ought to be, that they can intervene under certain rules or conditions. It is clear, however, that when we talk about uh, 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 having to do that, this is a, a very difficult task, you know. I mean, the, the, you know, you know, they should be, you know, just to get back to this. Remember, I mentioned to you that I was trying to lobby on this, and I and one of the things we tried to do was actually to propose a change in, in our case here, the Bank of Canada Act, so that they do monitor income distribution. But then the question is, what type of income distribution do we mean here? And how do we go about in formulating that? And this is where, as I saying here once again, is that I, I came to this conclusion uh, because the alternatives I think are much worse right now. Okay, so uh, it's not really so much am I comfortable with that, I'm not. You know, because depending on who is going to be the central banker, you know, they will act in a way that could either make things sort of, you know, better or worse. And the simplest example I gave uh, when I was presenting this was if you follow either the Pazinetti or the Smith and Rules or whatever, what happens in this context here, okay, is that where we're having the current uh, situation of fairly significant inflation vis-a-vis -vis the past, okay, what we should be doing in this case is actually trying to maintain some sort of stability in rentier vis-a-vis non-rentier income, which is the last thing that I would want to do in this context, which is to raise interest rates, okay? So this is why, uh, as I said, there's a real problem, and this is where the act you know, as I said, the art of central banking should be one that it tries to deal with that and reconcile what sometimes are difficult, you know, competing, you know, as I said, forces at work there. I don't know if that really provides a, 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 you know, a I don't have a simple answer, but I do have, in fact, a, a problem in the way the, the you know, these sort of uh, rules that we, uh, that, that have been proposed, can make it difficult for central banks to, you know, to, uh, to be able to, 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 to pursue better policies. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, yes, yeah. Okay. So it's uh, past time, however, I'm happy to keep the discussion going. I will stop the recording so we can 